Pozdravljeni, sem Marja Milič in gledate Money How, prvi podcast o upravljanju denarja pri nas. Tokrat malce drugačna epizoda, danes je namreč naš gost, investicijski maček Jim Rogers. Jim Rogers je avtor številnih knjižnih uspešnic, je priznani investicijski maček in pa pionir investiranja na trgih v razvoju. Leta 2007, torej tik pred borznim zlomom, se je preselil iz New Yorka v Singapur, ker je želel vzgajati svoje hčerki v Aziji in seveda želel je, da se hčeri naučiti tudi zelo dobro kitajskega jezika. Ja, Jim Rogers ima tako zelo zanimivo zgodovino, kar dvakrat se je tudi upisal v knjigo Guinnessovih rekordov. Prvič je prepotoval svet z motorjem in nastala je investicijska knjiga Investment Biker in drugič, drugič je s predelanim Mercedesom in z ženo prepotoval 116 držav in nastala je knjiga Adventure Capitalist. Sama sem imela že, mislim, da nekaj krat priložno spogovarjati se s Jim Rogersom o pač, na investicijah in njegovem pogledu na uh, trge. Sicer pa je gost številnih priznanih uh, poslovnih medijev in seveda danes je z nami tudi na Money How. Pogovor poteka v angliškem jeziku. Uh, mislim, da boste razumeli, če bi slučajno imeli neke težave, mi prosim, pišite, pa bom seveda tudi priložila uh, prevojstvo Vod. Mogoče sem mečkan tako za uvod, pogovarjava se o trenutnem aktualnem dogajanju na kapitalskih trgih, predstavil tudi svoj pogled na investiranje, svoj investicijski stil je tudi predstavil, boste videli, ima zelo zanimivo strategijo, ki jo uporabljajo tudi številni kriptaši, torej strategija HODL, um, potem seveda zelo je nagnen k investiranju na trge v razvoju, tukaj je potrebna seveda previdnost in pa seveda zelo dobro poznavanje uh, teh trgov, veliko je nestabilnosti, veliko je nihajnosti in tukaj tudi v bistvu pojasni, zakaj je za njega ta trg v bistvu interesantan, azijski trg oziroma trgi v razvoju. Zanimiva je tudi njegova, uh, njegova naložbena strategija, kar se tiče samih surovin, tukaj vidi predvsem priložnost v agro um, sektorju, zanimivo se mu zdi recimo um, srebro pred zlatom, uh, potem se vedaj izpostavi tudi nekatere druge um, panoge, sektorje, uh, ki se mu zdijo zanimivi, uh, predvsem pa se usredotoča na tisto, kar zelo dobro pozna in to je tudi njegov nekak glavni nasvet vsem vlagateljem, da investirajo v tisto, kar dobro poznajo in da ne lovijo vročih zgod. Tako, to je nekako kratak, kratak pauzetek pogovora, svetujem, da ga poslušate, pogovor se mi zdi kar zanimiv in pa mislim, da Je tak zanimiv pogled v investicijsko strategijo enega res vrhunskega strokovnjaka, ki je prepoznan kot strokovnjak, kot maček, borzni maček po celem svetu. Želim vam prijetno poslušanje. Yeah, we are six hours apart, so it's nine o'clock in, in the morning I here. I three o'clock in the afternoon here in Singapore, yes. Um, I just uh, started recording. Uh, this is not a live show, so um, I will edit it later. Um, I will have a short introduction of you in Slovenian language. I think it's just the best that we just start with the show and that's it, Okay. Okay. Let's go. Let's, how, how long do you want? You can have as much time as you want. How long do you want? Um, I think about 30 minutes, something like that, 30, 35. That's fine. That's fine. It depends. Whatever it, you want. I just it, want to it know. It actually depends on you. I don't know how you're going to answer to my questions. <laughs> well, I hope I give short, I hope I give you short sound Okay, bites. great. Okay, let's start. Okay. Wait, let me ask you, wait, wait, before you, what year were you born? Were you born before Slovenia broke up? When, when, what year I were you born? I was born in 79. I'm 43 years old. <laughs> 79. So you, well, do you remember? Yes, I remember. Uh, I remember it very well. How were we were bombarded in Slovenia? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, I, I, was yeah, I think, exactly 12 right. years old. So so you remember Yugoslavia and you remember breaking yes, up. Yes, I remember that, yeah. I also remember, oh I God. also remember when Tito died. Do you remember Tito? Of course I remember Tito. No, no, I, I let's see, I first went to 
Yugoslavia, probably in 1966. You weren't even born no. in 1966. I went there, and I've been there a few times since, and I remember that the coast was the most beautiful coast ride I had ever seen at that point. And I promised myself, I didn't have any money, but I promised myself someday I would come back and ride a motorcycle down that highway. Yeah. And wow. I did. Great. I did. Great. Yeah. I didn't see you then either. But Yeah. Uh, we have nice roads here for bikers, especially in, um, in I don't, I'm not sure if you know Socha. It's really nice a river, long blue river. It's like really, really nice. And it's a perfect location for bikers. Everything in Slovenia is nice, <laughs> including you. Do you remember, do you know Melania Trump? She's also from Slovenia, from a small village. It's not actually well, a village, right. it's a yes. town, Seunica. <laughs> so... <laughs> I forgot. I forgot. She, but she has U.S. passport yeah, now. Yeah. Yes, but I, that's right. That's and right. you probably know Luka Doncic. He plays for Mavericks uh, NBA basketball. Well, I know. I know of him. Yes, I don't. Yeah, I've I've seen. Him He's mention, also yes. Slovenian. So. <laughs> well, I think you're probably the best from Slovenia. Oh, the best oh, I know. <laughs> You're the best no, I know. <laughs> Thank you very much. It's really nice compliment. Okay, let's start. Let's Roger. start. Um, the last time I spoke to you was probably, I'm not sure, seven or, or six years ago. So I think we have a lot of catching up to do and we should just dive into the capital markets right away. As I may. Let's, Let's go. go. As I mentioned in the introduction, you are a very experienced investor and you probably have seen it all. You chased bulls and you chased bears and witnessed many stock market crashes and crises. What period in time throughout your engagement with capital markets would have the most resemblance to today? On the surface, it's the 70s. That's the last time that most of the world had a big inflation. Uh, f and it was caused in the 70s by too much money printing. But there are many differences, Marja. In the 70s, the United States was still a creditor nation. There was still the Soviet Union. There was still Yugoslavia. There was a red China. You know, there were many, many differences then and now. Uh, but I would say on the surface anyway, it's somewhat similar, given that a lot of money printing led to a lot of inflation. You often, um, you're traveling back in time. You remember things from the past. The one question I get from our younger listeners is whether I remember the first stock I bought. Do you remember the first stock you bought? And when did, did it happen? Well, I do remember the first stock I bought. I was about... 13 or 4, it was probably 1955 or so, or 56, and I bought it. I worked for a, a grocery store, and the owner of the grocery store uh, said that I should buy shares in this insurance company, which I did. I didn't know anything about it. I didn't know what shares were. I didn't know anything, but he was, you know, older and richer and smarter, so I did it on his say so. Do do you, I'm sorry, I didn't get the name of the insurance company. I don't remember <laughs> the name of the insurance company either. I mean, I sold it 15 or 20 years later at a at a small profit, but I don't remember anything about it. Um, how would you describe your investment style? Well. Uh, first of all, I will tell you my style, but everybody has to find their own style. Uh, my style, uh, I try to find things that are cheap. And usually if they're cheap, they're cheap because they're ignored and people don't care about them. But if I can find something that's cheap, where there's positive change taking place, then I might have a lot of success. Mm -hmm. And what is your investment horizon? And what asset classes do you hold and how do you approach asset allocation? Well, I like to buy things that I never have to sell. You know, I'm lazy. And it's uh, if I can buy something that's going to change for many years, 
positive change for many years. That's what I like best of all, because in that way, you can make a lot of money. I mean, China, for instance, China started changing a few decades ago. I plan to own my Chinese shares forever. I want my children to own my Chinese shares forever. Um, and if that's if that works, that's the best kind of investment for me. You know, if in 1922 you had sold your American shares, you would you might have looked good for a while, but over 50 years later, 70 years later, you would look pretty foolish. So I tr- I like to own things forever. It's rare. It's rare that I can do that, but that would be the ideal it's for It's similar to Warren Buffett's uh, investment strategy, just to hold forever. <laughs> Well, we all have to do it our own way, uh, and I'm not very good at short-term trading, so I don't even try. And I have learned that if you get it right and major changes, positive changes are taking place, you can make a lot of money. Um, okay, let's talk about the, our current situation in the aftermath of the coronavirus and the raging war in Ukraine. We are facing elevated inflation fueled by supply chain disruption and increasing geopolitical tensions between East and West. How do you see the current situation in the West from Singapore, where you have been since 2007? Well, we do have a a war going on in Ukraine, yes, uh, and that does contribute to inflation. We had inflation before that war started um, because of all the money printing that started in Washington, D.C., but then everybody joined in. So we've had huge amounts of money printing, and the war, of course, just accelerated, made the price of grain, made the price of oil go a lot higher. And as long as that war is around, it's going to contribute to that. It's also caused a lot of pessimism in the world. Uh, usually when there's a lot of pessimism margin, something happens to relieve the pessimism. I don't know. I have no idea if anything will happen this time. But let's say uh, that there were peace in Ukraine. And this is not, not, not a prediction. I'm just saying if there were peace in Ukraine, there would be a lot, big, big rally in many markets around the world because people would say, ah, Everything is okay now. Inflation will be okay now. uh, And markets would go up a lot. It won't be okay, but people would say they're okay. So because of all this pessimism now, I am looking for something which will come along and cause a big rally. I don't know if it will happen. In your last interview for Forbes Daily, you predicted that high inflation will be with us longer than expected and that we should buy some sugar why sugar specifically, and what instrument do you use to get exposure to sugar? Well, I just use sugar as an example because agriculture has been such a terrible place to be for a long, long time. Agriculture worldwide has been depressed for decades. And usually, if you can find something that's depressed for decades, you might make a lot of money if things change. Sugar was just an agricultural product. Sugar's down 70 or 80 percent from its all-time high. I was using sugar as an example of something that might, an agricultural product, that might go up a lot when things change. Um, what about other commodities? Well, Agriculture has been very depressed. I mean, the average age of farmers in America is 58. It's been a terrible place to be, Marja. I mean, more people in America study public relations than study agriculture because it's been so horrible. But that's worldwide. The average age of farmers in Japan is 66. Nobody wants to be, very few people want to be farmers anymore. So we have change is coming, we have to, or we're not going to have any clothes, or we're not going to have any food. Um, So I would suspect that agriculture, most agriculture products are a good place to do research and probably make Mm -hmm. investments. Any other commodities? Well, all of them, but agriculture is probably the worst or the best. But I mean, silver, silver is down 
70 or 80 percent from its all-time high. I mean, silver is very depressed. There are many commodities that are, if I, as I look around the world, Marge, the ch- cheapest asset class, well, bonds are certainly in a bubble. That, they're not cheap. They've never been this expensive. Many shares around the world have been forming bubbles. Property in many countries is a bubble. Korea, New Zealand, many countries. Uh, stocks have certainly been in bubbles. The cheapest asset class that I know are commodities. As I said, sugar's down 70%, silver's down 70%. These are not bubble kind of prices when they've been down mm-hmm. so much. And what is your take on gold? Are you adding any gold to your portfolio? I own gold. Uh, if, if and when gold and silver go down more, I hope I'm smart enough to buy more. If at today's prices, I would buy silver because silver is cheaper on a historic basis, but I'll buy more of both somewhere along the line. And I hope if they go down more, I hope I'm smart enough to buy more of both. Um, you said that if we want to deal with inflation, we must deal with the money supply. So central banks are hiking interest rates to fight against rising inflation and pausing or reducing asset purchase. Uh, do you have confidence in central banks that, that they will be able uh, to bring inflation down to target inflation of 2%. We have had very few good central bankers or smart central bankers in history. Uh, America's had one or two in my lifetime. Uh, India had a good one a few years ago. But Marja, there have been very few smart central bankers. Most of them are bureaucrats or academics. They don't really know what they're doing. Uh, they want to keep their jobs. You know, they, they do what they have to to keep their jobs. But very few of them really understand how the world works. Um, I would really love to know your opinion about Christine Lagarde, the boss of ECB. <laughs> well, as I said, we've had very yeah. few good central bankers in my, in my lifetime, and she is certainly not <laughs> one of them. Okay, the Fed and the ECB are signaling that they are willing to risk a recession to extinguish the inflationary expectations for running out of control. On the other side, the equity market is not entirely convinced of their resolve and believes that the central banks will chicken out. What do you think? Will they chicken out? Will it take a recession to roll back inflationary expectation or even maybe depression? Well, most people make their inflationary expectations based on their experience. I don't think many people even know what the money supply is, uh, much less how to judge it or follow it or or check it. Uh, Most people, if they go to the shop and prices are up, they know, they know that prices are up and that there is inflation. And that's how most people judge their expectations. I would expect that things will calm down a little bit for a while. We had this big run up and you know markets as well as I do. When there's a big run up, usually there's a correction somewhere. So if we have a correction in markets, inflation will calm down a little bit for a while before it starts again. And when it starts, when it calms down, people will say, oh, maybe it's better now. Uh, But then when it comes back, they will say, oh, oh, what do we do now? Because Marja, all, nearly all central banks continue to print a lot of money. And that is going to continue, add to more inflation in the world. Do you think we are moving closer to a perfect storm in the global markets? Yes, uh, it's been... 13 years since the Amer- I'm going to use America since it's the largest, um, since America's had a serious economic problem. That's the longest in American history. So based on history, we're coming closer and closer and closer to a big problem. We will have one. I certainly see the signs. Prices went up a lot. New investors came in. New kinds of investments came along. You know, you know about Bitcoin and and all the cryptocurrencies. This often happens at the end of a long bull market. SPACs, 
SPACs have been around 300 years, but they usually often have a revival at the end of a long bull market. Well, SPACs came back. Though I, all, there are many signs that we're getting closer to the end. So I would expect that when this bull market ends in the next year or two, if it hasn't already, it's going to be very, very bad. We had a serious bear market or problem in 2008 and 2009 because of too much debt. Well, Marjorie, since 2009, the debt everywhere, everywhere has skyrocketed. Even China has a lot of debt now. So the next time we have an economic problem, it's going to be very, very bad. Has to be because there's so much debt now. Um, Now that you mentioned cryptocurrencies, uh, do you think they will survive the bear stock market? Um, Most of them, many of them have already disappeared and gone to zero, as as you know. Uh, I would expect in the end that most of them, if not all of them, will go to zero. Uh, I don't see a purpose. I mean, trading vehicles, yes. And there are certainly people, smart people, who are trading them successfully. But I don't see the purpose of cryptocurrencies other than trading vehicles. And if they're just trading vehicles, fine. Who cares? Let them do it. Let them play. But I don't see any long-term use for cryptocurrencies other than possibly as trading vehicles. So you don't hold any crypto yourself? (laughs) No, I do not own cryptocurrency. My wife does, but I do not. Um, But you are one of the pioneers of investing in emerging markets. They have lagged behind the U.S. equity market significantly in the last decade. Do you see any investment opportunity here or there for the next five years? Oh, well, yeah. I mean, uh, Uzbekistan, it's an old Soviet republic. I've... That was a disaster under the Soviets and then a disaster after the Soviets. Uh, But recently, they've started making proper changes. They're starting to run the country the way I would run the country. So I've started making small investments in Uzbekistan. It's certainly an emerging market. Most people couldn't find Uzbekistan on a map. Uh, That's one. Uh, That's probably I am looking at others. I am looking at Cambodia. But, you know, most since the U.S. and Japanese and the big markets usually set the tone, I'm not in any rush because I expect big problems some um, in the next year or two in the major markets. And how do you approach investing in China? I own Chinese shares. Uh, I've owned Chinese shares for several decades. Um, my plan is for my children to own my Chinese shares someday. Um, and because I expect China to be a very successful country in this in this century, if if I had sold my American shares in 1922, I might have looked smart for a while. But 50 years later, I'd look pretty foolish. That's my view of China. There will be bear markets in China. There will be many problems in America. We had many. We had depressions. We had bear markets. We had a civil war. We had massacres in the streets. We had many problems, but America became very successful. That is my view of China. And what do you think about everything that happened? Uh, um, you know, the Ch- um, Chinese Communist Party, Iron Fist, actually uh, strike down the industries and discipline entrepreneurs in China. <laughs> well, there has been a property bubble in China for several years, the government has been talking about stopping it for quite some time. They never were successful in stopping the bubble. Now the bubble is popping, whether it's the government or the market or whatever. uh, And I would expect that to continue. You know, in the 1920s, America had a huge property bubble, which collapsed at the end of the 20s and helped lead to the Great Depression. So China has a property bubble, a very serious property bubble that is now popping. Uh, and I suspect it will add to many more problems in China in the next few years. But it's not the end of China. It was not the end of America in 1928. It was not, will not be the end of China. What about a Chinese tech sector? 
Well, I'm not very smart about technology. My 14-year-old daughter knows more about my mobile phone than I do. Uh, so I usually do not invest in tech because I don't know what I'm doing. I like to invest in things that I know about. What about, uh, I think the Chinese Party Congress is scheduled for October the 16th. What are your expectations uh, and how will this affect the stock market? Well, all I know is what I read in the paper. You know, the, the leader is going to have himself declared eligible for a third term, which has not happened before. Um, whether that's good for China or not, I don't know, but it looks like it's going to happen. But then China is going to have, and the world is going to have, economic problems in the next year or two, as we discussed before. Um, China has built up debt in the last few years. They do have a property bubble. So you're probably going to see some problems in China and in everywhere else, too, in the next few years. What about tensions between, between Taiwan and China? There is a very important industry, semiconductor industry there. Well, yes, uh, Taiwan is the most important semiconductor company from what I read. Um, and that will continue, I mean, unless it gets blown up or something by a, a crazy war. Uh, no, that that is going to continue. I don't, I do see other countries now developing semiconductor industries because they realize, oh my gosh, We've got all of our eggs in one basket or many eggs in one basket in Taiwan, and it could blow up. So many countries, including America, are now trying to develop their own semiconductor industry. It takes a while, but it will happen. Um, one question. Why actually did you decide to move to Singapore? Um, that was right before the market crash in 2007. You sold your $60 million mansion in New York and moved across uh, on the other side of the globe. What was going on through your mind then? And did, do you ever think about returning back to U.S.? Well, uh, Marja, if you'd asked me told me 30 years ago I'd be living in Singapore. I said, who are you? You're a crazy person. It never occurred to me years ago that I would be living in Singapore. I live in Singapore because I want my children to know. I have two teenage daughters. I want them to speak Mandarin, and I want them to know Asia. In their lifetimes, Asia is going to be extremely important, and Mandarin is going to be extremely important. It was a very simple thing. I was doing it in New York, teaching them Mandarin, but I realized if I was serious, I had to take them to a, a city where they had to speak Mandarin. And so here we are. It's mainly, so my, you know, many parents do strange things for their parents. They move to a place with a good football coach or a good band conductor. I moved here so my children would speak Mandarin and they would know Asia. And it, it has worked. So yeah, far. and this is one of um, um, lessons that you wrote, wrote in your book, A Gift to My Children. And many of my European colleagues have actually trouble understanding um, some of the lessons. One of uh, example that, of that is that kids should learn Mandarin. Do you think um, our children in the West also at advantage if they know Mandarin? Well, yes, because, you know, there are billion, 400 million people in China and many more in the world who speak Mandarin. And if China does continue to become the most important or one of the most important countries in the world, anyone who speaks Mandarin will have an advantage over the people who don't. So I still see no reason to change that. I told you, certainly China will have problems along the way, just as America had problems along the way. But in my view, I don't see another language. And I still see Mandarin as being extremely useful in their lifetimes. Um, this book, A Gift to My Children, was originally published in 2009. How many bits of advice from the book withstood the test of time? Well, that one certain. Well, we'll know. I mean, 300 <laughs> years from now, Mandarin may not be so important uh, as it is now. But, you know, uh, China is the only country in world history that's been on top the three or four times. 
Rome was great once. Egypt was great once. Britain was great once. But China has been great three or four times. They've collapsed three or four times, but they're the only country that collapses and then rises to the top again. So I suspect that learning Mandarin, at least in this century, will be useful. Uh, another lesson, I have two daughters, as I told, teenage daughters. Another lesson in there is beware of boys. That will stand, <laughs> that will stand the test of time. I know that, uh, I mean, I remember when I was a teenage boy, and I know other teenage boys, so I know that lesson will be useful for hundreds of years. Some of it will be useful. Yeah, um, I have to say that this is the one one of my favorite gifts to give to new parents, uh, to be honest. I also received your book uh, years ago from my partner, and it's really, really, really nice book. Well, hooray. If I get to Slovenia, I will come by and sign the book for you. Thanks. Thanks. Um, if we are uh, being honest, there is one more thing that I would really love to ask you. Maybe it's a stupid question. I don't know, but I really want to know. You are recognized by your bow tie. Is that your fashion stamp in the investment world? <laughs> no, it was because bow ties were cheaper. <laughs> And I didn't have any money, so I, I bought bow ties. And also, if you get, it's hard to get a bow tie dirty. You know, if you get a regular tie dirty, you have to get it clean and expensive. It's hard to get a bow tie dirty, and if it, if you do have to clean it, it doesn't cost very much. No, I was a poor kid, and you were very practical. <laughs> Well, I was trying to be practical, yes. Uh, so, uh, final advice to our listeners and viewers, how to invest during recession and volatile stock markets? Well, in the next two or three years, if not before, we're going to have serious economic problems worldwide. And my advice to people is, please, first of all, do not listen to hot tips when you're investing. Do not listen to hot tips from anyone, including me. Uh, and if you're going to invest, only invest in things that you yourself know a lot about. That's the only way you will be a successful investor. If you listen to a hot tip and it goes up, you don't know what to do. You don't know why you bought it. If it goes down, you don't know what to do because you don't know why you bought it. So if you invest in things that you yourself know a lot about, you will be able to do well as an investor. That is Strong, strong, strong advice. Do not listen to hot tips. Maybe if you get a hot tip for Marja, but otherwise, do not listen to hot tips. I agree with you completely. Mr. Rogers, thank you for your excellent advice, and it was an honor to have you on our, as a guest on our show. Thank you. Well, thank you, Marja. I do hope I get back to Slovenia. I haven't been there in many years, and if I do, I will sign your <laughs> thank books. Thank you very much. <laughs> Have a nice day in Singapore. You. <laughs> you too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye. you. Bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Let's do it again yes. sometime. <laughs> thank bye. you. Bye bye. The Koto Label Jim Rogers. A se mi zdi, da je bilo kar nekaj zelo zanimivih namigov v tem pogovoru, vsekakor je zelo pomembno, da vsak poišče svoj naložbeni stil, tako kot je rekel, in pa seveda tudi zelo močno sporočilo je to, da pač nekako se izogibamo teh vročih namigov, kajti zelo težko je v bistvu ustvariti neko stabilno, sta postaviti neke stabilne temelje na teh vročih zgodbah. Tako da, tako kot večka trčemo, pomembno je, da imamo pred seboj neke dolgoročne cilje, dolgoročni horizont in da vemo, zakaj gremo v neko zgodbo. Toliko za danes. Želim vam še naprej prijeten dan. Poslušajte Manihau, ne bo vam žal in lep pozdrav.